Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby, where we hope to be informative and entertaining and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. back again and it is time for episode 63 of plastic model mojo man the, the episodes just keep piling up here man and uh, i know tonight we got somebody in the third chair we've got uh, evan mccallum mr panzermeister 36 himself joining us we fired jim bates we got a new canadian <laughs> <laughs> he had to trade him in for a younger model that's right an that's upgraded right. canadian <laughs> how you doing evan <laughs> good how are you guys tonight uh, we're good. We're good. It's uh, a lot been going on around our neck of the woods, but uh, Evan, what's your model sphere looking like this week? We'll start with you. It's been pretty good. I uh, recently moved to my new apartment here and that kind of puts a hold on stuff, but we're settled in now and I've got my even bigger workbench set up. I'm working on a few uh, videos, editing, you know, it takes a long time and there's a lot of projects that were slow burners for a while. So a lot of finishing those up for videos I've also been getting into a little bit of photography. Now, I usually just do video, but uh, I'm writing an article for a book coming up, and I broke up my girlfriend's fancy nature photography camera, and I'm learning how to take photos, and it looks so much better than I when I take those crappy cell phone benchtop photos. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what the camera does. Oh yeah, there's a, a model, particularly model photography, because it is close-up photography. It is a super specialized subgenre of DSLR photography. Uh, but yeah, the, you can do some amazing depth of field things and lighting stuff, and then post production with uh, uh, with photo editing software, you can really do a lot to a photograph of a model. You raised one other question that I want an answer to. How long does it take you to produce and edit one? Your videos are what, about 20 minutes in most cases? Yeah, now it can depend. If I'm doing, a, let's say I'm reviewing some 3D printed tracks, that's pretty quick because I just film it live while I'm building. And I just, you know, it might take an hour of editing time, maybe two hours max and however much time on the bench you, it takes um, but when it comes to one of those weathering tutorials, which is usually four to six hours of video, which I have to chop down, edit, adjust, zoom in, then do the voiceover and everything, those take, I, I haven't timed it, but I imagine I spend probably 20 hours on some of those. Like they are, they are beasts of a project, but I don't do them all at once. I, you know, I'll do the chipping of a tank and I'll film it while I do it. And then I'll actually upload that and edit it. And then I'll move on to the next step because that way it's kind of fresh in my mind. But one thing it also does is it also slows down the actual, the building or whatever of the tank itself, because instead of just being able to build it, I have to build it and like contort my hands to fit the camera angles and make sure I'm not blocking everything and making sure everything's in focus. So it, it can, like there's been some projects where I want to sit down and build it, but I'm like, yeah, but then I want to do a video and it's going to take extra time and it kind of slows it down. And it can be a bit of a drag sometimes. Well, well, Mike's been thinking about this subject long and hard. So you're going to, you're going <laughs> to have to to give him some advice because he's. Yeah, I just bought a vlog camera. He's being tempted by the video monster. It's a, it's a whole other hobby in itself, let's just say. Yeah, I can imagine. Sounds like you're doing a lot of work, but it's good stuff. And a lot of people appreciate it. Dave, I know what's been up in your model sphere. And <laughs> uh, I want to yeah. extend uh, some condolences to the loss of your dad there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, I'll talk about that later at the end. But uh, uh, there has been some stuff up in my model sphere, despite the the other things going on in in addition to all the other hats i wear i am the newsletter editor for our local chapter of ipms usa and uh which means i have to crank out a newsletter every month which means i need to beg people for articles and they send me articles and then i edit them lay them out and in indesign uh 5.5 is the software i use I've gotten enough articles lately where I am now laying out the newsletter 
a month or two, at least the, the main meat of the newsletter, a month or two ahead of time. So I've been making progress on that, and that really helps to be so that I'm not doing it the night before it needs to go out, which is which has happened more often than I than I care to admit. So I've been making progress on that that front. Uh, in addition, I also have you know as my wife accuses me of being a a librarian who buys models rather than a modeler. I've been getting back into being able to read on the subjects that I like, aircraft and history and things like that. So uh, I've been knocking some of that out. So like usual, I tend to find inspiration from those things. So, you know, it's it's juicing the model sphere. It's, it's, it's getting the juices flowing. So things are moving along. I mean, they're moving in the right direction as far as, uh, as the model sphere goes. How about you? Oh, I'm trying to rescue the uh, Plastic Model Mojo archives. What Plastic Model Mojo archive? I did not see Evan. This is this this tells you things. I didn't know we had an archive. Do we have an archive? <laughs> yeah, it's a folder on my computer that has every episode and every video or every uh, audio file we've ever recorded in it. Oh, okay. And I spilled a cup of water on my laptop two nights ago. Ooh. And now all the input functions, keyboard, trackpad, mouse input, none of it works right. And <laughs> so I'm on a I'm on a loner piece of equipment from upstairs, from the lady gotcha. upstairs. And, gotcha. Uh, and it won't recognize my second monitor, so it's all jammed onto one screen. So I've got to take all the Mojo hardware over to a computer repair shop down the street from work. And I've got an older version of that laptop, and I'm hoping he can just swap out the trackpad and the keyboard and get me rolling again. But uh, if not, all, all the I can get it to boot up and all the files are there. I just can't, it, it'll do crap. Like if you click one icon on this, on the, on the desktop, it'll yeah. grab two or three at once. And I, so I can't copy and drag files anywhere. So if, if the keyboard itself works, there are still, I mean, it's cumbersome. No, it, does, it doesn't work. It doesn't. Oh, work. okay. The problem. So, so hopefully all will not be lost. Can you plug a USB keyboard in and use it that way? That's what I was going to suggest. Plug in a USB keyboard. Well, that's a good idea. I'll give that a shot. See if that works. See if we got one around here somewhere. I'm just shocked as an organized engineer that you don't have uh, backups that are absolutely 100% current. Well, I don't. So there you go. <laughs> Lesson learned again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. That's my. I'm in like panic mode almost. Not quite, but uh, no need. I've to had panic. worse. I've had. I've had worse crashes. This one. This one will be okay. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking. Even if you didn't recover any of it, you know, it's plastic model mojo is like Italians driving. What's behind me is not important. <laughs> <laughs> Evan, I assume you have a modeling fluid. Uh, you've joined in with us here. Yes, I am actually of legal drinking age too. That might surprise many people, but I do have something with me here. Uh, there I've we got, go. It's in a bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is Krabby's Original Alcoholic Ginger Beer. I imported oh, across man. the pond from sunny Edinburgh. I love this stuff. My girlfriend has a, had a bottle of this once, and I tried some of it, and it's amazing. But I'm a bit of a lightweight. I can't do strong alcohols, and I haven't really tried many of them. So I'm not like you guys drinking the gasoline and stuff. But... <laughs> I like this stuff. It's pretty good. <laughs> now, it's just ginger beer? No, this is alcoholic ginger beer. Okay. So, so about, what's the percentage of on it? Do you know? 4%, four percent it says on here. Oh, well, that's that's not bad. That There are session beers, uh, things like that, that are 35 4%. Well, maybe in the so, United States, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Up true. Up here, 4% is a light beer, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You'll have to bring a bottle to uh, Omaha. Can I take alcohol on a plane? I don't. I I don't <laughs> see why not. Now you're go, you're going international. Yeah, there might be rules regarding that. But yeah, in the U.S., you can. You got to check the bag, though. Yes, you do have to check the bag. We'll see. So, Mike, uh, what's your modeling fluid? Oh, I got a strange one, man. <laughs> okay, please tell me it's not peanut butter whiskey. It's not good. Detling, 1867, Alabama bourbon. 
Alabama bourbon. That's right. Hmm. I know. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you, A, how did you come by this? I had a colleague here in Lexington from my long stint at Lexmark International. He finally got tapped last year during all the downsizing and he had to move to Huntsville. Well, he chose to move to Huntsville, Alabama for a job. Yeah. And uh, they were up visiting a couple, three weeks ago and he's good about bringing housewarming gifts. So he had not tried it yet in, the, in almost a year he's been down there. So he brought it up. It's from Atmore, Alabama. I've not even looked yet. I know where the, Atmore is it's right on the Tennessee border. No, that's Ardmore. Oh, yeah, you're right. That is hard for. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll I'll let you know at the end, man. Okay. Do you know what the alcohol by volume is? It's it's uh, 80 proof, so 40. Oh, okay. It's a bit stronger than what I've got here. Yeah, just a touch. Dave, what do you got, man? I know you got something, and you're probably going to open it right here now. No, no, actually. In a, tip, in a tip of the cap to my dad, he was a very light drinker, but... Um, Every night when he came home from work, he would always have a single highball. And that highball was made of Coke and Rebel Yell bourbon. Oh, man. Now, now keep in mind, Rebel Yell is not the world's top shelf bourbon. Now, it doesn't come in a plastic jug or, you know, it's not that. but But it is a very economically priced bourbon. Kind of as a, a, a hat tip to him, I'm having a highball tonight made with uh, Coke and Rebel Yell bourbon. Guys, the listener mail has been coming in, and it's uh, some interesting stuff here. How about we just get into that? Sounds good. Well, we saw this gentleman at the Indie Show, and he's also in our own home club, Alex Restrepo. Yep. Because we gave him a tip at the show about paint brushes. We recommended Zim brushes, Z-E-M brushes. Yep. He found a good deal there, like I knew he would, and uh, so I just want to plug Zim Brushes again. They run good specials on their website from time to time, and I know you can also get them through Sabo Miniatures. Mark Spurberry's company sells them as well. Well, John McAvoy's written in again, and he's calling us social influencers, and he sent us a photograph of his uh, his wooden block with his two holes in it for uh, the micro-scale uh, decal setting yeah. solutions. Yeah. A bottle of bullet sitting behind the between the booms of a Ravel, probably formerly monogram P thirty eight J Lightning. Good man. I wonder why he's building that one and not the Tamiya kit. It's a good question. That bourbon's got about three pours out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you are a bad influence. I'm I'm not caught up on all the other podcasts, but he's got a uh, a shaker bottle of uh, maybe you've heard of this. It's like talcum powder. But it's called uh, anti monkey butt powder. <laughs> <laughs> i guess he's spending a lot of time at the bench in the seat there you go <laughs> i don't know john you have to tell us where that came from maybe one of the other podcasts oh here's an interesting interesting one warren dickinson from uh, elkton kentucky now he's written in several times in fact i think yeah. the last episode we had one from him but uh somebody was talking about a place to get good resin tracks and i know evan we're going to talk a little bit more about at least 3d printed resin tracks at some point in this episode but uh he, he specifically, well, the, the question, oh, who was it? It was Stephen Lee talking about 72nd scale tracks. Where's all the 72nd scale tracks? Well, right. They're at OKB Grigorov. Right. Familiar with them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they do a lot of 700 scale resin ships, some oddball ones. They do so, a lot of uh, a really neat 72nd scale armor related yes. stuff, in, including tracks and road wheels and turrets and, and all that jazz. Now, <laughs> Being in Russia, I don't know what the current status of uh, getting stuff from them would be. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know. I don't know. Evan, Evan, do you do any 72nd scale armor? I've done a couple, but I can never... Uh, I've done a couple of dragon ones, which are very well detailed and everything, but I can never really... I never really finish them because I like to add a lot of detail to the builds and everything aftermarket, and I, I just find that those kits are sometimes a little bit... I can't get the, the fine level of detail. And also when it comes to the weathering as well, I feel a little bit handicapped there, but maybe I should just give one a shot and and see. I mean, maybe I could go to 48 scale first and see how that works. That's pretty popular. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know. I, I kind of, I've done that little Bofors gun and I'm, I'm probably going to do another one. Probably another old 
clunky airfix one. Life's too short to build bad kits. Uh, I know it's nostalgia for you. Well, we've got our uh, our every two week question from Michael Karnaka again. All right. Kit announcements that excited us but never came to fruition. And he says there's a Czech plastic manufacturer announced about 15 years ago, an XP67 moon bat. Yep. And uh, was only etherware. Yep. So he's asking us what kit excited us only to be let down by it never coming out. <laughs> well, I can think of one off the top of my head. Uh, and who knows, it may eventually come out. A, I think it was Kinetic, but I'm not 100% sure. At one point, a number of years ago, announced a 72nd scale C-17, uh, which we need in 72nd scale, but it's also a massive, mass would be a massive, massive model. And they announced one, and then it just never never heard hide her hair since then for me that's the one that sticks out in my mind evan i've got something here which is related to this topic that is the Rightfield model two years ago announced a kv1 model 1942 something which was supposed to be like the only kv uh sorry kv1s that are on the market are like you know the trumpeter ones and recently tamia came up with some good ones too but the trumpeter ones still seem to be the, the best so this this Rifle model kit was announced two years ago, and there was nothing. Like it was radio silence, and then maybe a month ago they finally said, "Okay, we're gonna put this out now." And I was I almost forgotten about it, but I'm really excited for that kit because I I love Russian armor as much as I do German stuff, and the KV one is uh, definitely one of the the beautiful ugly beasts. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Is it actually out, or did they just say? Well, we we really mean it this time. Yeah, I think they just released like more detailed CAD renderings or something, yeah. and they might have announced it coming out in a couple of months or something. But they showed a scheme too. Yeah, related to that, I think there was also uh, did Border Model announce a Panzer III around the same time two years ago? I think they did, like a Panzer III L or J, same time Rifield Model did, and Rifield Model made a Panzer III. Yeah. But I'm still waiting for the border one. I'm still waiting for the border Stug to come out as well. That was supposed to come out in February. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, you don't get disappointed on those. Well, you know, with all the with all the Roro ships piled up uh, outside ports in China, there could be a lot of stuff that's out there that we can't get. Yeah, it could be bad. Well, I was going to mention that KV kit too because I, I saw the news as well that uh, it looked like it might actually come. But I, I can go way back. Dave, you'll remember. I don't know if Evan will remember or not, but uh, he's too uh, young. Bill Miley and Chesapeake Model Designs, the resident. Oh, company. yeah, remember Bill. I remember. Maybe it's good that I'm too young to remember that. Well, it was good stuff. Yes, but prior to that, before Bill got into the resin kits, he actually tried to start an injection molded plastic model company called MP Models, Miley Production Models. Yeah. And he came out with a, an Israeli M51 Super Sherman. Right. Yeah. And this is, Evan, this is back far enough that the only the only Russian kits out there were Tamiya's. Yeah. I and mean, there was the, the, the two, the original two T-34s, and there was uh, the SU-122 and the SU-85. This Super Sherman, this M51 kit, when it came out, it, it was to be this adversary series. So... The, the the second kit he was supposed to do was uh, an SU-100 self-propelled gun. Right, for the Egyptians. Yes, and I was or... like, bated breath, waiting, 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 and it never, the company was gone. I mean, it just, it just never happened. <laughs> which which is funny because I know that, uh, that M50, M51 Israeli Sherman was a very popular kit when it came out. Yeah, but gosh, the, the the capital to start something like that. Yeah, I know. Particularly back then, before yeah. stuff was, you know, before technology made a lot of this stuff a lot easier. So I don't know. That's that's the one that really sticks out to me is, is that kit. And then uh, I, I just hope we see that KV kit because the, the CAD looks pretty good. I think it's going to have like an articulated suspension and everything on it. Yeah. Now, when that kit was announced two years ago, I had just bought 
trumpeter kv1 and some resin stuff and also the tamiya kv1 and tried about all the stuff to make a a proper kv1 by kit bashing all these things together and then the, <laughs> when they announced it two years on i still haven't even started the uh <laughs> the stuff i well, bought it now let me ask this because again i'm i'm you know you you two will start geeking out but is what they've announced a different version of a kv1 than is currently available or are you just hoping for a more accurate rendering of what's already available it should be one that trumpeter already made right trumpeter's made this one correct yeah i think so but it's got a special it's got like the anti-aircraft machine gun mount which i don't think is available and maybe apart from aftermarket and it's it should be way more detailed and have a lot more photo etch and everything than the existing trumpeter kit which is probably older than i am up next greg williams from uh, west alexandria ohio uh he met us at the indianapolis show uh it was his first trip to roscoe turner and he, he really loved it and it's, it's a good show um, it is it's a great show we got to get evan to come down it's only what 12 <laughs> 13 hours that's right <laughs> well he can't make nationals but uh he's asking about our, our show in louisville and wants to know if there's gonna be online registration for that or if it's gonna be on site only no it, it, they'll do online they they do online we haven't gone to completely online only but i don't know when it will go live but it'll probably go live sometime here shortly up next eric Simmelmayer. he finally says he got the cojones to order a harder and steam back airbrush Good for him. So he went to Model Paint Solutions and uh, found out that their prices were very favorable compared to other folks selling the HNS airbrushes. Yeah. So he's convinced to go with Dr. Strange brush. And there was something else he ordered that he was having trouble. Well, that John Miller was having trouble with on his own workbench. And uh, John called Eric and explained what the issue was. And talked him out of what he was going to order and put him in something that was actually less expensive that he could actually endorse more faithfully. So there you go. John really is. He's one of those people in the business side of the hobby who really cares about the hobby aspect of it. So even, even if he has the opportunity to make a sale, he'll, he'll give you his actual best advice, no matter what that means for him. Our friend, Father Deacon Raphael Shelton from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He's got an interesting one here. Um, well, he he's, talks about cross-pollination in the hobby, and, and uh, he's kind of a, a sci-fi kit basher kind of, kind of modeler. And he says he's been surprised by techniques that are, are expertly handled in one small genre or one small corner of the hobby that's like completely unknown in another one. And he, for for example, somewhere he saw a lot of uh, scratch builders using CA kicker, uh, you know, an accelerator, right? Super glue, uh, right out using the pump spray bottle. Mm-hmm. And and he his he's of the opinion that I agree with that most more fine scale model builders know. Uh, most of us ditch the spray top. I know I do. Right. I don't know, Evan. What do you do? Oh, I don't have any of that stuff. Oh, really? <laughs> I- I don't have any of that stuff. <laughs> oh man. So he's ditched the accelerator altogether. <laughs> I know I kind of do every once in a while. I'm trying to glue something with my uh, VMS fast, apparently fast setting glue. And you know, CA dries in 0.1 seconds when you don't want it to. And if you that's want true. to adjust it or if you don't want to adjust it, that's when it, you know, takes an hour to dry. I just had that experience. I was on the phone with Skippy King the other day while I was uh, doing some modeling and attaching two parts with super glue. And I got the two parts together, but I also got a little on my finger. The part I got on my finger dried instantly. The super glue between the two parts took a full minute, minute and a half to dry. And I do not understand that. If you if you get it on the wrong spot, it'll dry immediately. It just, it's bizarre. Well, and he also talks about uh, the Gunpla modelers have, have for a long while been using uh, some of these more high-tech scribers to do panel line detail because that's kind of, I guess that's kind of a, if you're not building a Gunpla kit out of the box, this is a really common thing to do is add other panels and trick them out and stuff. And 
he's of the opinion that most folks in the hobby on the other side of the hobby are still using, you know, V groove type scribers. I don't yeah. know if that's true or not, but I, it certainly, they certainly are, but there, there's a lot of scribers out there that, uh, that are square groove scribers. You know, right. More, I know like all the ones Voitech sells are that way. Yes. And, and, and most of the new kind of avant-garde ones you can buy through the different suppliers now are square groove scribers. Uh, but he's got a point. I think the bigger point is it is an interesting phenomenon. And, and I tell you, and Evan, you might be able to relate to this since you're, you're kind of like me and you're, you're into model railroading as well. Uh, currently, I'm not so much currently, but I, I certainly was in the past. Do you belong to any model railroad group up there? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, there's some, well, there's a, there's a local group here and also Facebook groups and everything. And, I do get whenever I post weathering stuff and I show the products that I'm using that are, you know, you might call them air quotes, armor modelers, techniques and tools. A lot of the uh, guys interested in weathering model railroad stuff, they, they, they say that they're not familiar with this, but a lot of them are interested in giving it a shot. So things like these MIG ammo oil brusher paints and everything and hairspray chipping, those are not, I mean, previously not, tools to many model railroaders they're more used to using you know pan pastels and so on kind of my experience too when i was doing some clinics with our local intermara chapter uh, i did one on decaling and I, I tell you most of those guys had never done any kind of layered clear coating to hide the film they, they didn't take much care in how they cut the things out of the film and i think particularly aircraft modelers have kind of paved the way for the the more expert t- expertise in kind of decaling and and it was really eye-opening for a lot of those guys and it was really well received but uh i, I see what he's getting at here it's it, it's uh it's interesting and he's he's got some uh youtube channels he's, he says it's a good place to cross pollinate and learn different things it's it's a uh, boily hobby time uh bill making stuff and studs and studio so i'll have to post these to the show notes and check these out myself to see what kind of kind of stuff these people are doing because th- I've actually seen studs in studio and uh, I, I do have a recommendation for the end at the, during the, uh, the recommendations that they wrap up that I'm going to talk about for some cross pollination as well, but we'll leave that to the end. Mark Sprayberry. We've already mentioned him. Uh, he gave us kind of the, the background on, on warrior scale models, but I think most of what he said here is, is kind of what we already know. We were kind of wondering what's happened to him since, since the demise of, uh, Squadron, squadron mail order and i think john bonani actually wrote in and or sent us a facebook message saying that uh uh guys can't remember the guy's name but he's a he, he's like on scale model graveyard the, the guy that sells all the kits on there end up buying yeah. a bunch of squadron i think he probably owns that stuff now uh anyway craig cooper greg cooper that's right yeah uh so we'll see what happens see if we start seeing any of that stuff again or if it's even relevant anymore i don't know which gets me to the, the last points Mark makes because he, one of his sculptors, uh, Jim Rice, not the Hall of Fame outfielder <laughs> for the Boston Red Sox, but a different different Jim Rice, uh, did some sculpt for Warriors, and he's he's sculpting for Sabo now, yeah. and uh, it's all three D sculpt, it's all printed masters, yeah, which is interesting because. 3d printing these organic shapes is, is it's, it's, it's interesting how well like layer lines and stuff are hidden in, in those kind of things versus more like engineered parts where right. you have, you know, have, you have like regular angles and squares and square sides or, or round, round cross sections, which actually can accentuate layer lines. But it's really interesting how that's, that's, that's moved. Cause you see a lot yeah. of that. There, there's a lot of folks out there now. There's a lot of, people doing this uh this 3d sculpt you know i bought uh i bought one of those star wars ones i haven't printed it yet but uh it's all 3d sculpt all all the figures in the set i bought are 3d sculpt well and you've seen out of ukraine master box is doing all the you know uh given the current unpleasantness in ukraine they're doing a bunch of uh immediate releases of figures from the current conflict, and all of those are 3D mastered. Evan, you got anything on that one? What do you, what do you think of all these figures? You, but you do, you don't do too many figures, do you? I don't typically do too many figures. No, I, I'm not. 
I'm not nearly skilled enough at painting flesh and everything to to do these often, but I have seen the 3D printed figures. And I think those like Panzer Art and other guys are doing these as well. And I think that was what, was that what Martin was doing on his Yag Panther? Were those 3D printed figures? Night Shift Martin? Uh, uh, maybe. They might, uh, they, they might well have been. There was one that definitely was. I don't know if it was on the Yag Panther or that, that big French tank he built. Yeah. But what I've seen, 3D printed figures are looking, you know, they're, well, they're definitely better than injection molded plastic ones for, for one. They're up there. And last from my end, Dave, is uh, Scott Stokowiak from the Mid-Michigan Modeler Makers, Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, he heard me talking about uh, moving to some scalpels instead of X-Acto knives yeah. uh, for, for some stuff. Now, not everything. And he's, he said he never really thought about the difference before, and he's asking how they're different. Uh, well, the, the big thing is they're a hell of a lot sharper because the blade cross-section is a lot thinner. You mean by scalpel? Scalpels. By scalpels, yes. And there, there's a that can be advantageous more often than not. I think now the downside of scalpel blades they're they're not as nearly as rigid as an exacto blade for the exact same reason they're yeah they're half or even a third the thickness. I've just uh, I want to give them a try. I, I I think the advantage is the sharpness primarily. Uh, Cost wise, it's not that much different. I, I burned through exacto blades like nobody's business. I mean, well, luckily, luckily you have a sharps box to put all your old blades in. Yeah, I do. It's getting full too. <laughs> <laughs> Exacto blades, by comparison, just aren't as sharp. And I tell you, another thing you got to watch. I bought some off-brand blades, and I swear, oh. man, they're like they're like Exacto's seconds, they're just yeah. reboxed for somebody else. They they don't even have points on them, and they're terrible. So I got to get some new ones. Do you got a scalpel, Dave? Yes, I use uh, I've I've used uh, a scalpel for years along with Exactos for the exact reason you talk about a uh, scalpel. The blades are I've got a Swan what they call a Swan Morton handle, which basically is the scalpel brand I think out of England. Um, but the blades are incredibly thin and sharp. Um, they're really good for precise cutting. Uh, like if you were cutting the edge of a de- cutting out a decal or the edge of a, a right along a, a decal print or something where you needed fine control and you know sharpness where you didn't want to get tearing. Now, but they are flexible. So if you're cutting something where you're having to exert a fair amount of force, the blade will flex. That's one of the places where an exacto comes in better. I have sworn off in my old age using both blade uh, exacto or scalpel blades beyond their life. Uh, you know, some people use that same piece of sandpaper for uh, uh, you know for for years. Uh, same thing with exacto blades or scalpel blades. I change my blades religiously now. I burn through them er- nearly every session where I have used a blade to do something, to do cutting, you know, at the end of it, I'll just replace it. Evan, what do you use? Much like the, C- the CAA cooker, I um, there's, there's a lot of tools that I don't have that I really should. CAA cooker, photo watch bending tools, and uh, scalpels. I don't, I don't use scalpels. I just use exacto number 11 blades, and I probably should get some proper knives because I'm always cutting stuff and it's not working right, and I'm like, damn it, <laughs> I should get a proper blade. Well, wait no, a minute. You you don't have a photo etch bending tool? You're kidding me. Don't you watch his videos? I use tweezers and pliers and I just make it work. <laughs> well, you need listen, you need to get a photo etch bending tool cuz I will tell you and I keep in mind I hate photo etch and I don't do it much, but when you do it, photo etch bending tools make life so much easier as far as getting particularly a good 90 degree fold, particularly along a long piece of photo etch, like a fender yeah. type thing. Yeah. That's a, that's a money. That's a tool that is well worth the money spent. Someday I'm going to do a T34 with the full photo etch fenders and I'm going to need that. Yes, you definitely will. I've honestly been thinking about getting a photo etch bending tool for at least three years, but I just keep putting it off <laughs> and I'm not sure which one to get, but I mean, I guess your listeners could, for next episode, give me some recommendations on what full bending tools 
are good for them. Well, I still use my Exactos quite a bit. I, I'm not going to, it's not a full blown replacement, but it's because of the rigidity issue. But, you know, I, I've got number 11s. Num- the number 10 blade is my next favorite. It's the uh, the rounded one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great for scraping stuff along the, you know, rubbing it perpendicular direction and scratching stuff away, seam lines and stuff like that. Yeah. But anyway, scalpel's really sharp. And uh, I guess that's it. Really sharp. <laughs> You know, if I get a scalpel, the first thing I'm going to do is just cut myself with it. You will do that. After I'm working with an exacto blade scraping seam on stuff, there's always all these little scrapes in my fingers that aren't bleeding, but you know, there's like little nicks and stuff, and I always <laughs> see them, and I'm like, "Whoa, how'd that happen?" <laughs> well, Davey, you got any uh, thing off the Facebook feed? Yes, yes, I do. I have a couple. It is amazing what a community the the listeners have become i was working from home tuesday you know just doing work and uh, about 10 or 11 o'clock i get a facebook message from mike halliday a, a listener in iowa and he asked me if i had a 70s the mpm kit the 72nd scale yosuka glenn uh, it's the little submarine launched float plane that is actually the only only aircraft to ever bomb the continental United States. And I told him, yeah, I would had had that kit at one time, but I upgraded because Fujimi released one and he didn't, wasn't aware about that. And then we talked about he's got a vacuform, the Eagle's Talon wings vacuform of that aircraft. And there's no injection molded version of that plane. And the next thing I knew, we were in about a 45-minute conversation back and forth about the aircraft, its history, the fact that there's a, you know, been at least two kits in 72nd scale and injection molding, but there's nothing in 48th and what, what pieces and parts that you could use to help. He wants to knock a vacuform off his bucket list, and he's got that kit and... and is looking at using that kit. It was just a pleasant conversation on a on a topic that came out of the blue, and it was a very very pleasant conversation. And so, Mike, I appreciate that. And then we had another modeler reached out who was listening to us, who found us, and was carving through the back episodes. A guy named Tyler Artis. Uh, let's see, Tyler's from Zanesville, Ohio, and he listens to us. While he's at work, uh, he does apparently shift work. He works 12-hour shifts. He was talking about listening to the podcasts while he's working. But the only downside is, he says, when he's listening, it inspires him. He wants to quit and go home and and hit the bench, which... uh, you know, uh, while I appreciate the I appreciate the the sentiment, you know, you got to pay for the models too, so probably can't do that. But it was a it was nice to hear somebody new listening to uh, the back content. Evan, do you want to chime in here? Oh yeah, yeah. There was a there was a previous question that I kind of wanted to add something else on to, and back to the cross pollination, I guess. I've actually uh, watched some of Sudson Studios videos. My girlfriend watches stuff like that, and. I sometimes just look over her shoulder when she's watching stuff. And uh, his videos are really, really good. On the topic of cross-pollination, continuing this on, another thing my girlfriend likes to watch is people who repaint dolls. These are dolls that are like high-end kids' dolls, I guess. And people will like take acetone, wipe the faces off, and completely repaint and redo them to a much higher level. This is like some art thing on, on YouTube, and they make clothes for them and stuff. And one thing I've noticed when I'm watching my girlfriend watch these videos, it sounds like I'm trying to say that I don't watch these things. Like, (laughs) but they are very, they are very well done. Um, People also really like to use watercolor pencils when they're working with the skin tones on these uh, dolls and they're repainting them. And I remember watching her watch these videos, stuff like that, and thinking, wow, those watercolor pencils look like a really useful tool. And then a couple of months after that, AK Interactive came out with those watercolor weathering pencils, which are the same thing, but they're in colors that are meant for, uh, they're they're artist watercolor pencils, but they're in modeling, air quotes, uh, colors. And I think that's another area where there might have been some inspiration from the doll painters or something, and there's some cross-pollination back to the armor and aircraft models there. 
And I do have those AK pencils. I have not given them a shot yet, but they're supposed to be really good. You need to, you, let me tell you, I think that AK watercolor pencils are the best modeling item to come out since pre-cut canopy masks. They are fantastic. Uh, also, speaking of YouTube, go on YouTube, go watch. AK has like two or three videos on how to use them uh, because there are multiple techniques. There's a wet application technique. There's a dry technique. There, There's bunches of ways to get some very interesting effects. And the beauty of them is that if you don't like what you did, you can just simply erase it. Uh, with a with an eraser or wipe them out with water. I I am really really a fan of those things. So I would urge you to go ahead, watch those YouTube's, pick up an old uh, paint mule models and start playing with them because I think you'll be amazed by what you can do. What's most attractive to me with the idea of these is actually that I can work over top of oil paints. So I don't have to apply a varnish because yes, they're based on different thinners. If you don't like the oil paints, you wipe them off with enamel thinner. Then I can put these right over top, and if I don't like them, I can wipe them off with water, and it won't damage the previous effects. No varnish required. This is the moment in the podcast where I ask uh, folks who are listening, when you're done listening, please go to whatever podcast app you listen to us on, rate us. We'd appreciate you giving us five stars. It helps the podcast become more visible to a wider audience. Uh, as I've said before, we continue to grow two years into this, um, which is all thanks to you listeners. The other thing you can do is we all know another modeler who doesn't listen to podcasts, maybe because they're not as technologically savvy. Please take the time to talk to them. Tell them that you like our podcast. Tell them what a podcast is encourage them to listen and and maybe help them out so they can start let you show them how to start listening and um we appreciate that we in fact had a couple of folks at indianapolis say that uh, come up to us and tell us that they had done that uh for fellow modelers and we really really appreciate that that's right. After taking time to rate the podcast and you want to check out even more podcasts you can do so by going to modelpodcast.com Modelpodcast.com is a consortium website set up with the help of Stuart Clark at Scale Model Podcasts out of Canada to serve as a repository for all the other podcasts who've elected to participate with us. You can go to modelpodcast.com and find a straight link to uh, all the other podcasts out there in the model sphere. So check it out. In addition to podcasts, please check out the content from our blog and YouTube friends. We've got uh, Stephen Lee with Sprue Pie with Frets. He's always got something interesting to say, and he has quite recently, in fact. Yes. Chris Wallace, model airplane maker. Check him out at his blog or his YouTube channel. He's got some videos out there that can be helpful if you're into aircraft, for sure, because he does a fine job at, at what he's doing there. Uh, the Inch High Guy, Jeff Groves at Inch High Guy blog, all things 72nd scale. And uh, he treated us right at Indy again. Yes, he did. If you're into 72nd scale, Jeff's your friend. He's got some good <laughs> stuff going on there. Yes, and, <laughs> and, and one of those modelers who will uh, be more than happy to reach out and help you if That's you've right. got questions. Open-ended book loans. Yes. And we can't not mention Jim Bates, Scale Canadian TV, pumping out his uh, hilarity yes. on the on the subject of scale modeling. And Evan, we're going to let you plug your your little your little deal. Tell us about your <laughs> YouTube. Deal. Tell us about your YouTube channel. Yes, I run the YouTube channel uh, Panzer Meister Thirty Six, in which I mainly look at painting and weathering World War II armor. Um, but there's also some model railroad stuff on there. Some builds. There'll be some dioramas and scenery work. It's all, it's all whatever I want it to be. But it's all modeling stuff. And I hope you guys enjoy and learn something new from my videos. I know I sure have. You've you've been doing this for. I'm just looking at uh, at your YouTube channel. You've been doing this for eight years. Yeah, I was just a little boy when I started. <laughs> <laughs> With the squeaky voice, right? Yeah. Yep, we watched you grow up, man. <laughs> Finally, if you are not a member of your national IPMS chapter, that's IPMS USA, IPMS Canada, IP IPMS uh, UK, 
IPMS Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Please consider joining your IPMS national organization. Does a lot to promote the hobby. Uh, uh, many of the chapters do uh, really nice magazines. In addition, they help local chapters organize, and and they're a real positive in the hobby. So, and usually membership is very very inexpensive in the scheme of things. Uh, you know, for the cost of one model kit in most cases, or even less, you can get a year membership to your national organization. So please consider joining. Well, Dave, we've mentioned him once. Let's have a word from our sponsor, Model Paint Solutions. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder steam back airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. Well, we're back, and it's Wagons Ho for Omaha, Dave and Evan, and uh, it is 79 days until. Oh, my. God. The 2022 IPMS National Convention in Omaha, Nebraska. So that's like right around the corner. Yeah, two months and a two months and a bit. Every time I've been listening to one of these episodes, it's always 100 days, 90 days, 80 days. And yeah. my uh, <laughs> my my M10 Achilles for the Plastic Posse group build is still half done. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that's a high bar because man, what those guys did in Las Vegas. They whipped that group build together and then all all entered in Las Vegas and and won an award. And I'm telling you what, they they did some fantastic stuff. Yeah, this one's going to be better. Oh, well, this one's going to be great because I mean, uh, Las Vegas was fantastic. Don't get me wrong, but uh, Omaha, we're going to have uh, people from out of the country there, so that'll be even better. Well, we had the show chairman on last episode, and he gave us a lot of good information. Still, the big plug we're going to give tonight is to keep keep feeding them trophy sponsorships if you can. That's the, yes. the one piece of the pie that still needs to be baked, I guess. And, you know, to get back to what you said, we got some uh, international folks coming, and uh, that might even include you, Evan. Oh, I'm I'm going to be there if I have to, you know – forfeit my Canadian citizenship and <laughs> <laughs> and go to an embassy or something. <laughs> I assume you're flying in. Uh, 99% I'm flying. The drive is, is very, very long and, and I have to stop at all these hotels and stuff. And it's going to cost like the same as a flight would in the end. Anyways. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so if you, yeah. so if you look, have you looked at the flights to see what they look like? Yeah, I've been looking at that the past couple of weeks with a, a buddy here who's going to fly down with me and be at the show. Yeah, I'm probably going to book my flight this week. I, I, I mean, I booked the hotel already when that was available. I'm in the same hotel as you guys with the uh, with the convention there, so I can you know stumble back uh, stumble back to my room from the Mojo Dojo after the. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll make we'll make sure you get back to your room. Trust us. Now, are you? Are, do the flights look like they mostly go through Chicago or? Oh, I, I th was it Denver? I think it was Denver, right? Denver, really? Yeah. Okay. I think I, I might be completely mistaken. Well, are you going to try to travel with anything? Well, I'm going to have to bring this M10 with me, and well, not if you like don't I get it done. You won't have to. <laughs> It's it, I've I've moved models to shows like I went to Heritage Con right that was a six hour drive but that's nothing compared to an airplane right so I'm gonna have to make a custom box to carry this thing and I, it might be the only model I take with me because of how tricky it's gonna be. Well, just just remember carry on, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and don't put it in the overhead. Keep it on your lap. You put it under the seat in front of you for takeoff, but then just keep it on your lap. That is the one way to make sure that. It makes it intact. Yeah, there's a lot of photo etch I'm putting on this thing. It's going to be a nightmare. Just can't have any of the other uh, passengers helping TSA take stuff out of the conveyor. Yeah. What yeah. happened to me? But it wasn't <laughs> terrible. No. no. Could have been a lot worse. Well, Evan, yeah. we look forward to having you there, man, and uh, hanging out and hopefully get that model done and can enter it and go from there. It's going to be a good time. It really is. Oh, yeah. Nothing motivates like last minute panic, right? Yes, that's uh, right. That's, that's true. <laughs> I did just finish my university engineering degree, so. <laughs> well, now yeah. you've got all that extra time to build. And money. 
It's time for the Bench Top Halftime Report, Dave, brought to us by Tackett Z, our friend Ed Tackett. Tackett Z, the must-have tools for the model makers. Uh, you can visit TackettZ.com to see what Ed's been up to. Please check out Tackett Z and see what he's got. He's always coming out with something new that, that might be useful on your workbench. So, Dave, what's on your bench? It's understandably the, the last week or so uh, uh, production has not moved along as it might otherwise have done. I did actually, though, make some progress on the B-52. Uh, it is the point where all the major components are together, sanded, uh, primed. I've started putting the actual base coat on. This thing, once the wings are onto the fuselage, which is really about the only thing I have left to do, this thing's going to come together very quickly. It will definitely be at Omaha, no questions asked. And then I can move on to getting the M30 done. Evan, what's on your bench? Well, of course, there's the uh, the M10. Well, it's on the corner <laughs> of the bench. It's been there for three months untouched, but I've got to finish that off. Uh, the, the build's coming along well. It's the Tamiya M10 Achilles 2C. Um, but my advanced modeling syndrome kicked in, and I've got a lot of, a lot of 3D printed uh, detail parts and photo etch and brass gun barrels, et cetera. Maybe I shouldn't have done that because I, I bought the Tamiya kit so it would be a nice, easy easy build, and then I shot myself on the, on the foot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great Any, kit. Anything else? Uh, yeah, there's a few model railroad things I'm weathering as uh, kind of fillers between projects. I like that stuff because I can just go straight to weathering it and go pretty heavy with the rust and everything. But as for armor, uh, I've got an RSO Pack 40 here that I was working on, Dragon Kit. And once again, advanced modeling syndrome kicked in. And I've been having a lot of mojo issues recently with the AMS kind of making me spend too much time thinking about the details that don't really matter. And it stalled a lot of builds for me recently. So I should really just, I have a Tamiya Char B1 that I could build and I could not do any research and just let it be fun. That's a, that's an idea for me right now. But there's also a few other things in my bench that are also kind of ground to a halt. I've been getting a lot of uh, a lot of interest in uh, late war German camouflage schemes because uh, later in the war people think that everything was set out in red primer and was half finished, you know, within the last days of the war. But really, if you look at the pictures of the last German tanks, they are still finished to a very high degree of of uh, especially especially the camouflage is really really intricate. The reason for that is that later in the war the Germans wanted their tanks to be camouflaged while being uh, transported by rail to the units because of allied air superiority. So uh, tanks were actually painted in full camouflage in the factory rather than being painted at the unit level upon delivery. So there's these really intricate camouflage patterns that I'm doing a lot of research on for some late work projects. And uh, these are, these are uh, because they're standard factory, factory applied camouflages, they're essentially the same on every single vehicle of that type. So there's always a yellow stripe here and a red stripe there and a green stripe there and everything. So I'm going through all the photos I can find of these things and kind of assembling from different views all around the vehicle what the full pattern looks like and then trying to airbrush it or hand paint it. God help me. <laughs> and uh, I've got a few projects that need those late war camouflages because I've been really into that recently. So I've got a Stug, King Tiger, Yag Tiger, Panther, and a Jagdpanzer IV that are all, well, most of them are right up to the point of being ready for paint. I've actually started on the Stug, but it's also ground to a halt. So I've got a question for you, Evan. When and, and this is tangentially model related, I guess. Um, when you do one of those model railroading uh, rolling stocks, and you talk about the fact that you enjoy it just because you dive right into the weathering. How long does one of those typically take to weather from beginning to end? Oh, it depends. I've got a couple that I did pretty quickly. Just, you know, yeah, airbrush on the, the dust on the bottom. They call it the road grime. Um, airbrush that the couplers are in wheels rusty. And then you just do maybe a couple of scrapes and scratches. And that's like an afternoon. But I've got one here that I'm going like full hairspray chipped repainted areas, rust streaks. That I'm going to have to do with probably three layers of because of all the different colors, multi-layer chipping. Like it's basically at this point going to be as much work as if I was painting a derelict 135th scale tank or something like that. So 
they can they can definitely vary like you and I, I guess that's one thing i like i mean you could do that with a tank as well you can make a tank have that almost like factory finish where you basically just give it a wash maybe add a little bit of dirt and dust and call it call it a day there or you can go you go ham and you know make it full night shift <laughs> <laughs> so the the trains are no different than that it's just that i can go like you said straight because it's already built and painted you just go right into the weathering which is my favorite part of the hobby weathering first all right mike what's your bench looking like my, my bench is moving slow evan uh i'm trying to get this base work done for this stinking zis to any tank gun i've started gluing the crates in the pallet on and trying to get some of the peripheral accessories glued to the base and then i opened up my little tin tin box that i keep all my near finished stuff in and there's a lot of crap under there that's still not painted so i've got some rifles to paint and the gas mask and bag to paint and quite a few other things so i, I gotta get on the stick and get this done because this one's omaha bound and it's so close i just, I just gotta get it done i gotta quit farting around so now the gas mask and bag you scratch built right well the the mask yes and the hose and filter were 3d printed, the, printed. Uh, the, the the bag is probably a dragon part that i hollowed out with a with a rotary tool and I'm, I'm gonna have to make a the flap for it because it's gonna be in the open position yeah which makes me it makes me want to try that vms paper shaper stuff yes we need to make a vms order i think so so you do, uh, and you need to get their varnishes, their oil expert, and paper shaper. Absolutely, those things. Evan, you need to email uh, Mike and I a list of the VMS must-haves. Well, that's my bench, Dave. I, hopefully, the next episode, I'll be a whole lot closer to done on this thing. I hear you. I hear you. We're all we're all hoping for a little more progress. Um, <laughs> in the in the last uh, month or so, have you seen any? Any model announcements that tickled your fancy that uh, made you sit up and go, yeah? I have, for sure. All right. Well, give me your first one. In the continuation of TACOM's Naval Ordnance Series with their 72nd scale turrets, they've just announced the B turret for the Scharnhorst, which really excites me because the, the B turret is almost identical to the C turret, the aft turret, which had the catapult and float plane on it for much of the inch would correct you and tell you that's the X turret. Okay. Well, the X turret. Yeah. Uh, it's sitting on a tall barbette because it's the second position turret on the, on the fore part of the ship. So the, yeah, it's got a double height barbette on it, but it's got the range finders on it. The front turret did not have the range finders. The range tur- finders on the B turret served for both guns, I guess. Right. And then they had to have another one on the on the on the back end for the for the lone turret back there. But anyway, that's going to be the quickest path to get the model done that I want to get done. You know, right after I bought that model collect turret, this gets, <laughs> this gets announced. So that's my favorite, my first one anyway. So I guess Evan's next. Evan, uh, what caught my eye most is. A lot of more 3D printed parts, uh, like tracks and sprockets and stuff like that, from uh, mainly T Rex. They're doing a lot recently. They've got a, a recently I saw some Panther uh, ro- uh, late or road wheels that are like disassembled and stuff like that, and uh, late idler wheels and parts that are previously only available. I think is like metal uh, details, uh, which are going to be useful for a late war Panther project I have planned for the future. Uh, but I think that recently in an episode, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, uh, Mike, had these as a yawn, <laughs> 3D printed tracks. I did, because to me, there's getting to be a glut of them. I mean, there's so much overlap. Yes. And it's, it's like every week they keep coming out with more and more. And I guess I'm I'm personally tired of seeing them. I've not tried them yet. I'm sure some of them are beautiful. I mean, it's not a yawn because I think they're they're not a viable product. Uh, there is one thing though I've, I've talked about and is, is that, uh, you know, I, I had a 3d printed part that was given to me some time ago by, by Jeff Groves and it, it set out unpainted in ambient room light for about a year and it's completely unusable now because it's so brittle. Oh you yeah. Even touch it. And I, I'm just curious what's going to happen to a lot of these 3d tr- tracks and stuff, 3d printed tracks that are in blister packs that are going to be hanging on hobby shop shelves or in warehouses with the lights on all the time. (laughs) 
six, That's eight months true. down the road, are they going to be, are they even going to be usable? So if you're getting them, I would put them in a dark place. I do have a bunch of the sets here and I do plan on doing a YouTube comparison of all the brands, because like you said, there's a, there's a lot of them. Uh, currently I've got uh, Voyager's uh, 3D printing subsidiary, which is Heavy Hobby. Yeah. Um, I've got one company here called Rosh M Model, R-O-C-H-M Model, uh, which are from China. And they're, uh, they're making 3D printed accessories as well uh, as PhotoWetch. I have a special type of Panzer three four tracks from them that, uh, that no one else makes in metal and stuff. I've got ET model, which usually makes photo etch. They have right. a 3d printed track now too. And I've got, um, tank craft tracks coming and I'm going to have a uh, T-Rex tracks soon as well, if I can find some. And there, there's more I saw on, um, on a YouTube channel, uh, cold demons, this feel, I think, um, he had some, which I think were clickable resin tracks. I didn't, Honestly, I, I haven't watched the video yet, but I saw it and I'm like thinking, how is that going to not explode? Because those uh, injection molded mini art, uh, were they mini art? Uh, the T34 tracks with the molded on pins that are supposed to click together. Those things just disintegrated immediately. And uh, I can't I can't imagine how 3D printing is going to be uh, less brittle than plastic, but apparently they seem to work pretty well. But yeah, every week there's a new a new company making 3d prints right so we got to figure out which ones are the which ones are the good ones and which ones aren't same thing i did with the metal tracks last year on the pt76 i built i used some uh frill tracks on that thing and it, it was the first time in a long time i'd actually you know used the blackening blackening solution and, and taking that route to weather them I, I think for the metal tracks that's kind of the advantage i i don't know what do you, what do you think you, you think uh from a finishing standpoint that the 3d printed stuff is going to be, is that a red herring? I guess that they're going to be harder to paint and manage and, and do all that. Yeah. Work. I mean, that's the thing, like the metal tracks, they have that realistic sag to them where they, they actually hang down and they, they look real without any adjustment. And the fact that you can blacken them and then at the end, sand off the exposed edges to get that worn metal look is, is really useful. Uh, at least in Canada here, metal tracks though are very expensive uh, 3D printed tracks are cheaper, but not that much cheaper. They're probably, you know, three quarters the price sometimes, which isn't, it's like, it's like a tough thing, right? You save a little bit of money, but then you have to, you have to paint them and prime them and they're going to be a little bit more hassle to work with. Uh, some brands, the pins apparently seem to fall out. Uh, I was talking with uh, my buddy Bruce from the YouTube channel, Bruce, the model noob on Skype the other day. And he said that, you know, like, these 3D printed tracks, they could be super cheap, but it seems like the companies realize that they can just price them a little bit lower than metal tracks, <laughs> just a <laughs> little bit. And, uh, and just like, cause these things probably cost nothing to, to print when they're just dumping them out in mass production. Right. Yeah, probably true. Well, I'd be curious to see your, your video comparison when it comes out and just see the, the overall quality and, and as far as assembly and, and, uh, accuracy and that sort of thing. I suspect you probably won't do the uh, leave them all out for a year and just see, see which brand goes to hell, right? <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> so far the heavy hobby ones look pretty good. I, you know, they're you're talking about being brittle. We use a resin at work on our, our Form 3 printer that Form Labs makes. It's called the Tough 1500. And that stuff has got pretty good detail coming off the printer. And it's, it's certainly flexible. And I, I think, you know, maybe they're using a the resin along those lines. It's not the typical brittle stuff. Dave, you got a fave? Well, yes. Um, my, my new favorite, <laughs> and it's not new now, they've been around for a number of years, but uh, uh, new favorite model company, Arma, announced a, a new kit on 72nd scale of the KI-84 Frank. This is a kit we've needed because the, the, the available previous kit was the Hasegawa kit from the late 80s early 90s which was a fine kit still is a fine kit but it has all of the limitations of those Hasegawa kits from that time period uh, particularly in regard to a lack of an appreciable interior I used to say if I was stuck on a desert island and could only build one company's model kits for the rest of my life, it would be Tamiya kits. But uh, I'm I'm coming around to the idea that 
it would be Arma because they are really knocking it out of the park. And I imagine this kid is going to be awesome. So you have another one, Mike? I do. It's a figure set from ICM, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> and, I, and I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know, they've been going gangbusters on these World War I figure sets. I think they've got most of the major armies covered now in, in one or two sets each, even some of them. Uh, they've announced a set of a U.S. infantry wearing, if you're not familiar, the Brewster body shield. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> Oh my god, I saw those two. I I thought and, that was a joke. I was not I don't know if the AEF ever actually fielded it in combat, but it they look like nineteen fifties uh matinee, you know, sci fi monsters or astronaut spacemen or, or whatever. It's it's really crazy. And it, it just made me think I've yet to see the big twenty five figure, forty figure over the top kind of trench diorama yet from because all this is still kind of nouveau, right? Yeah, we've got all we've got all these armored cars. We got the tanks now, and now there's just all these figure sets, and uh, there's so many now. They're doing something like this, and this one's really really crazy. But <laughs> I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> it looks like, admitted, it looks like the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah, sort of does. <laughs> Evan, you got another one? Uh, no, I don't have any other faves. All right, you got a yawn? Oh, I, I've got a I've got a yawn. Yeah, I saw this. I think it was today which was Trumpeter announcing a 116 scale Yagd Panther. And I'm sure a lot of people are interested in this, and I respect your opinion if you are, but personally, I think 116 scale armor is way too big, at least for me. Like, I don't have enough space on my workbench. Like, my workbench is like 11 feet long, but there's only about one square foot of actual clear space at any given time. So I can't even fit a 116 scale kit on here. But also, like, if I start building 116 scale kits, where am I going to put them when they're done? Each one's going to take a whole section of my of my shelf instead of putting five small kits on there. And, I mean, when you look at a lot of these 116 scale kits recently, the detail doesn't look that much better than 135th scale. They almost look like they just upscaled them. And and then the 3D printed accessories, if you want to go up with the de- with the detail level, are like four times expensive as the 135th scale stuff. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are excited about this. And a lot of people were excited, of course, by the 116 scale Stug that was announced at the the Vegas show. But I'm not not even interested in that Stug 3 kit because it's just, it's really big. I I don't see a reason why I would, no, I I just, I'm not really interested in it. I don't know why it's, because I could just build a, a 135th scale, like I can build that exact same vehicle in 135th scale with the tack on blitz kit that came out the year before. Well, the, the problem I have with the one sixteen scale kits is it's hard to not make them look toy like there, there's something about that step up from 35th to 16th scale that makes the model look like a toy. And ironically, you have the same problem at the other end when you scale stuff down from 72nd scale to uh, 144th scale for smaller items or 200 scale, the items look toy-like. There's a sweet spot in the middle between 35th scale and 72nd scale where they're just the right size to look good but not look like toys. I think it has to do with the plastic Um, because when you get to small scales, of course, you have to oversize the details. Right. I think around 35th scale is where, you know, like finely molded plastic. That's kind of like where where it it seems to to appear, at least to the eye, to be reasonable in scale to some degree. Uh, PhotoWatch also. I think when you get to 116 scale, PhotoWatch looks way too thin, under scale almost. Yes. And also because the kits, like I said before, in 116 scale, the plastic molded onto them, at least like the parts themselves don't seem to be much more detailed than 135th scale. That might be why they look a little toy-like because they're just, you can almost see how much, how, how chunky they are um, better because they're bigger than if they are in 35th scale. That might be why, but I've seen yeah. some good, like JB's working on that 116 scale stuck on Facebook, right? And his looks amazing. Yeah. And you, but the camouflage work, it's much easier to make it look like fine and in scale. So 
there are some benefits, of course. What else you got, Dave? Well, uh, I'm going to go back to our friends at Arma again. As you know, they they released the early versions of the P51s, which 72nd scale modelers had been clamoring for for a long time. Uh, and they've done a beautiful job with the P51B slash Cs. They have announced a F6C, which the F6 was the reconnaissance version of the P51C. They've announced it. It's actually in the boxing. It shows in French markings, but this is, this will fill in nicely the, the P51. You know, if you want to build a collection of P51s of all the different subtypes and varieties, the fact that you'll have an F6 is is a nice addition, and it's a great kit. So I'm happy to see that. Mike, you got a favor a yawn? I don't. I don't have either one. I had those two this time. You got. You have a yawn. Do I have a yawn? Actually, no. I do not have a yawn. I'm. I'm. Maybe I'm just in a good mood. Maybe I'm not. Uh, maybe I'm not as grinchy as I should be. Uh, actually, I have one more fave, which is in 72nd scale, and I think they've also announced it in 35th scale. IBG uh, has announced the uh, Ukrainian APC, the BTR4E, which is a an eight-wheeled uh, APC with a 30-millimeter turret, a, a turret on top with a 30-millimeter gun, and... Um, Given given many of the films and videos and photos that we've seen, it has interesting possibilities. So I um, I I would be anxious to to see that. All right. Well, let's move on to our uh, feature segment tonight, and we're talking to a gentleman that we met out in Las Vegas, Mr. Ed Barrett, who's a big time award winner at the national level. He's he's he cleaned up at, at Las Vegas, and uh, he's done some uh, nice work across a lot of scales, seventy second scale armor. 48th and 32nd scale aircraft. Ed's going to talk to us a little bit tonight about applying a system engineer's approach to scale modeling. And uh, he uses this kind of on his complex projects, maybe even a small ones. So let's see what Ed had to say, Dave. You got it. An actual rocket scientist. Well, Dave, we have a guest tonight. We met in Las Vegas exchanging stickers. He had a little table outside in the mezzanine uh, handing out uh space related material and I ran in and got my space related material and we swapped stickers and then later on at the show we set some uh tickets next to some models we were impressed by and lo and behold one of them well actually more than one about two of them at least two, two or three were built by this gentleman Mr. Ed Barreth from uh, sunny southern California he's a retired engineer from Jet Propulsion Laboratory out there and uh an absolutely fine modeler Ed how you doing tonight I'm doing fine and I'm been looking forward for this for a long time. Well, I'm sorry it took so long, but uh, <laughs> we 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 uh, run a little uh, loose here, and uh, sometimes it uh, we might need to tighten it up a little bit. So uh, let this be our our first uh, major effort in scheduling, and hopefully we'll do do better going forward. Uh, Ed, give us a little background about your career first, and then uh, you know we're going to talk a little bit about system engineering, which I think you were, and then uh, how that applies to modeling, and then you've got some other some other tidbits you'd like to share with us. So uh, let's start with your career and then how, and after that kind of how you got into scale modeling as, okay. as a modeler. Well, obviously to the audience, you've mentioned California, but what they're hearing is New York city. I was obviously born in New York city and I went to college there and I had a chance to go. I got a scholarship to go to UC Berkeley for grad school and I went there for my master's and PhD in mechanical engineering. And from there, I took a job at JPL and worked there for 30 years and uh, sort of retired from there and did some other consulting and what have you. So I've sort of led a very linear life, grow up in New York, moved to Berkeley, moved to LA, and, and here I am. And as for getting into modeling, the story I was told is that when I was five years old, I would go with my mother to visit my grandmother in a nursing home. And we lived in Queens, and my grandmother lived in, in the Bronx, which, if anybody knows New York, that's a long train, train ride away. And so when she got to the, the, the place for the, where my grandma was, she had bought me a, a model just to keep me busy while she was with her mom. 
And that's where I started. <laughs> and I basically grew up on the monogram series of airplanes. The Avenger, Wildcat, Hellcat, uh, that, that whole series of seven that to this day I, I, I still love with the folding wings and the, and the retractable landing gear and the dropping of the bombs and then the sliding of the canopies. And maybe that's why I became a mechanical engineer. But that's really, really the models that, that I remember from my youth. Well, let me ask you one question career related for my own satisfaction because I, I i recently joined a company in in the the greater modern space space industry um what what time when did you start at jpl i started in 1981 and okay. i was involved with the with the projects at jpl I had a series of them i was i happened to be for one of the shuttle missions i was actually in houston when we had an experiment on the uh, shuttle and i was actually in houston on the um in the in the room for the experiment and uh obviously if you look up edmund c barrett you can see the papers i wrote and various other and sundry things i asked because we had a uh i mentioned this i think our last episode or and maybe a not in a conversation with another modeler with dave along that uh what i've learned in the last year in my new job is just how small a community the space industry really is because we had a, an offsite training session with a third party outfit and the, the gentleman giving the, providing the course had been in the space industry since the late sixties. And after meeting him, I was like one person removed from everybody who's ever been in the space industry. <laughs> Some really, really famous people. It's kind of cool. <laughs> well, Ed, tell us, tell us a little bit about, uh, system engineering and, and how, how, how that might or might not apply to modeling. And uh, I'm just going to let you talk, man. That's usually how we do it around here. Okay. Well, that's fine. Uh, and some, some caveats to the audience. When I'm talking about system engineering, what I'm really talking about is I am giving, give you some hints and tips. So you will finish your next model. I've just been surprised that there are so many modelers who haven't finished and, and, and have a shelf of doom. Um, and I don't understand why. Um, to me, modeling, that, that's one of the best things of the hobby is finishing a model. And the other thing that I look is there's no, half, there's no partial credit for half-filled models. You, can, you can't take a half-filled model to, 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 to the Nats. You know what I mean? And, and people just don't want to get tired of seeing them at your local, con, you know, your local clubs. Yeah, yeah, Fred, you know, you, you've had it that way for 60 years now. We're going to do something. And so I'm trying to get people to finish a model and try to find out why they don't. Because to be honest, that's, that's never been my problem. And so one of the things I'm thinking is just to give some advice on how to finish a model. And the first thing I, I was saying is to clean up your workspace. If you're going to start a new model, I honestly think the best odds you have to finish it is if you start with a clean workspace. Get rid of the stuff that's been sitting there for six months. Clean up the dust so the dust won't be on your model. Move the, you know, Find the parts that you've been looking for, for for a year. Give yourself some space. To put the new model, to get, it always gives me a lift. You know what I mean? It's, it's a very sort of selfish thing, and it's a great thing to start. It's your kit, your space. Clean it up a bit. Just so, uh, just so you don't have any frustrations when, when a, a piece bounces out and you have to look through everything to find it. Well, I understand that. And I think for somebody who's already modeling and, and they finish a project, to put that away and to clean up after that. We've talked about that a little bit of before, haven't we, Dave? It's kind of yes. cathartic. Yes, we have. Yeah. Uh, that's right. In, in addition to the, the, the high that comes from finishing a model, the ability to then clean off your desk and be faced with a clean palette really, really does help get you to on to the next model. It just, to me, it reduces a lot of frustrations. And I think frustration is what probably one of the biggest reasons model, models don't get finished. 
modelers get f very frustrated with their work or the time or the, they have no space to, to put anything. So that's the simplest and easiest thing to, and, and a, a lot of the tips I'm talking about, you can do while you're enjoying your modeling fluid, you know, which is the best thing. You know, you, there's nothing wrong that you can sit there with your <laughs> modeling fluid and clean up. You know, that's, that, that's perfect. So when you get a clean desk and you take out your new model, what I always do, and again, I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm simply telling you what I do is take out the instruction sheet. And I love to write on the instruction sheet. And if you can't write on your instruction sheet, like, you know, um, um, sometimes Edward makes these really fancy ones that you can't write on. Make a copy so you can put your notes on it. And one of the notes I always start with is, what's the model for? In other words, is this an out-of-the-box model? Is this a contest model? Is this a commission model? You know, in, in my case, I also do models for my demos, for my table. And so who is the model for, to be honest, when it's finished? That is the most basic system engineering question you can ask. When I finish this model, who will see it? And if the answer is nobody, I'll just make it and put it in the closet and what have you. Then fine, you're, you're free to do anything you want. Put the wings on upside down. You know, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. As long as you're enjoying yourself, no one's going to see it. Have, knock yourself out. You know what I mean? That's fine. But if you say, you know, look, I'm doing this for a contest, I'm doing this for a group build, I'm doing this for, for something, then it, it matters because to step back for a second, what makes a good model to me? When have you made a good model? And to me, every time I make a model, it is a good model if there are no visible flaws from the distance that most people will see it. That's my criteria for a good model. Okay? If you can look at it from where, you know, for most people, and you don't see any, any visible flaws, no wheels are crooked, no wing is higher than the other wing, no anything, you can't see any visible flaws, then you've made a good model. I, I, there's nothing better you can do. It doesn't matter if it wins an award or not. That's the best you can do. And... The variable that I, that I promised to mention before, the variable is what's the distance it will be viewed at. That, to me, is the question you have to answer before you start the model, because the answer to that question makes everything else clear. Once you decide that, that tells you the criteria for how well you have to make your model. If you decide, for instance, obviously there's Nats coming up in Omaha. And there are people out there, I assume now, who are building a model for the competition, for Nats. Now, obviously you have to understand no one is going to look at your model closer than a Nats judge. Okay, they're going to look at it from three inches. They're going to put, you know, flashlights on it. They're going to they're climb all over that model. Okay, nobody's gonna no one is gonna look closer except the, except the police if you use it as to murder somebody. That's the only way <laughs> somebody's gonna look closer. That model is gonna be looking close. So to be honest, if you want to make a good competitive model for Nats, it has to have no visible flaws at that distance. And that's a challenge. Let me ask you this, Ed. Do you well, I mean, how do, how do I even say this? Do you purposely model at different levels for yourself? For for instance, if, if you're going to build an out-of-the-box for your own enjoyment versus one you're going to do for a national contest, or, or or are you your own worst critic and, and build to that that higher level most of the time because you're, you're going to be looking at it at three inches? I fight that. Because, <laughs> and, and, and I do, but 
the, the whole idea of the system engineering part is to separate the, the sort of the classes and the way NASA has a class A for missions and a class B and a class C. I do that for the models. When I'm making, obviously, a model for contest, that is a class A model. That is a model that I'm going to be to try to be as you don't see any flaws at, at three inch. You know, when I wear my Optivisor, you need to put on an Optivisor yeah. and look close to see a flaw in the model. That's the goal. Well, I think my modeling my modeling got better as soon as I got an Optivisor, right. just because I could I could you see could what see. I wasn't doing right. Okay, so <laughs> that's a class A, and that would be Nats. That would be sort of if you're making one for a museum, what have you. But to be honest, if you're making a commission, how close is somebody a commission? If you're making a model for your friend or for something like that, he's not going to be looking at it from three inches. He may be a foot away. You know, you give it to a friend and he looks at it. It's going to be, you know, a foot away he's going to look at it. No one is going to look at it from three inches. Well, well Dave's, building a B50, Dave's building a B-52 for his brother, Dave. You listening to this? Yes, I am. That's absolutely right. Well, I, I am using the, the, the model to sharpen my skills, but yes, I am less concerned about uh, uh, micro, micro, micro viewing the model since it is going to ultimately end up covered in a Lucite case on a base and, and be sitting in my brother's room. Exactly. To be honest, and, and to do anything else, to make a Class A out of that model, to me, is inefficient and a waste of modeling time. Yes, you can make it wonderful, you know, make it Class A. But, sure. but to me, you're wasting, time, you're wasting time that you could spend building another model. It doesn't, yeah. it's, it's inefficient to make it that good, so to speak, to that distance. That's the variable that decides everything else. So make it for where, where it's going to be seen. If it's going to be a photo, and I agree, and I've done the same thing. If, if I make a model that's in a friend's thing and it sits in a, in a Lucite cabinet, you know, on, a, on the guy's desk, and even the neighbors who come by and looks at it, nobody's going to be more than two feet away, you know, less than two feet away. It, it doesn't have to be flawless at, at three inches, and it's a waste of time to do so. And the same thing when, I, when you talk about my modeling, you saw that I had a bunch of models on my table at Nats. Mm -hmm. You know, those are demos for, for the science when I take them to classes. Obviously, I'm not doing that class A. That's, that's class B at best. You know, none of the kids are going to come up and look at it from three inches away. You know, I, <laughs> and, and it's a waste of time because if it goes out, it's going to come back broken anyway. You know? <laughs> And so it's just inefficient to me. That's part of the system engineering is make the model for, for the for the right audience, so to speak. And that's class B to me. That's that's your friends. That's your uh, group build more than likely. I mean, and you just did the same. You're not going to make a group build, usually not to the same level yeah. that, that you make it for yourself. It's just it's just inefficient and not a good use of your time. And that's I agree, and that's what I do. I also have a class C. To me, a class C is a very unique thing, more for Los Angeles. Uh, just to give you a little <laughs> hint, because we're involved in, in the entertainment business, right. and, and once in a while, and it's, it's even happened to me, and it's happened to other people. You'll get a call from like a casting, you know, or a director. You know, we're, we're going to be shooting a kids' room, and we want a model hanging from the ceiling. You know. Can, can you bring me a 30-second Spitfire tomorrow? I'm like, yes, but it'll smell funny when I bring it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can, because no one's going to look at it from less than 20 feet. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I, I can work on it tonight. I, I can build it and paint it and this, that, and everything. Yeah, because I know no one's going to be looking at it close. And, and the same thing when, you, when we talk to prop people. You know, there's a lot of prop people in our clubs, and they talk about how they would love – to, to do something real detail, but you know, they just get in a prop and get it out and what have you. So to me, that's class C. Class D is uh, teaching my, my neighbor's six year old daughter to make a model. That's, that's class D. We just sit up and glue stuff. 
And so that's pretty much the modeling spectrum. Everything I can think of falls into one of those classes. And if you put that at the beginning, if you decide what that is, that tells you how to make the rest of your model. It also tells you what to concentrate and what not to concentrate on. If you're making a model, that, you know, to me that's class B, that's for friends or, or a commission, it doesn't make sense to make a class A cockpit when the rest of the model is going to be class B. You know, the, it just doesn't make time sense. It teaches you that, okay, the whole model has to be good at this distance. That's fine. Then you can also use that distance to understand in every way you make for the model. You understand how well to make the finish. You understand how well to, to do things. It just leads into everything else. And, and I'm hoping I'm, I'm being clear and, and not being too preachy. But to me, that's that's what's you know that's what makes it different, and that's what gives you frustration because you don't start halfway. You know, I think I'm going to make this model, and then halfway you decide, you know, I'm going to make this a contest. And if you haven't made, you know, if if you're making a model for Nats and you haven't decided it's going to be Class A from day one, then then you're in trouble. You know, if you're going to make a contest, if you're going to make a contest model, it has to be class A from day one. You can't decide, you can't do two, you know, make a class B kind of thing and then say, you know, I think I'm, I haven't really worked about the finish, but I think I'm going to put a natural middle finish on it. You know, what the heck? You know, it's, I, I guarantee you, it's it's going to be end up on, the, on that shelf of doom. What's next after? Uh, what's next after uh, deciding the audience? You think? Well, after you decide the audience, then you understand what, what what makes the model good. Then you can. Then there are other things that you want to consider, that, and you guys have talked about it along. Okay, I now I've decided I'm going to do this model. I'm going to do it for this audience. I'm going to make it this. I'm going to use this stuff. The other thing is, what's new? What am I doing different for this model? You guys have always talked about that. To better, I think every time you build a model, it should be something different and something new to get better. Absolutely, something. Maybe, maybe you want to try PE. You haven't had used PE. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you want to use a natural metal finish. Uh, maybe you want to scribe the panel line. And, and again, I, I do mostly airplanes, forty eighth and thirty second. And, and I do 70-second armor for, for fun. Um, and so you want to try something new. However, from a system engineering point, you don't want to try too many new things. Nothing will sink a project faster than too many new technologies. And, and, and Mike, I'm sure you can see from, from the space point of view, you know, that, that will kill billion-dollar projects if you try to do too many technologies. Not not even space. You you can back up to my twenty twenty something years in consumer products. The last thing you wanted to see on a project plan was a a module of the project that required an invention. That that's that was going to be the long pole, no matter what. If it's if something's going to sink a project, it was the fact that you had no solution for a particular problem. Right. No, no, no. I'm saying, and, and in space, that's where it starts. You always have. I mean, that's the whole point. You're doing a project right. that has something that hasn't been done before. But if you have too many things that haven't been done before, like the I worked on the X-33 and what have you, and it just, there were just too many new things. And so, yes, you want to do PE. You want to try, you know, get your stuff a nice little Zoom kit. You know, start small. Um, don't say, you know, I've never done this before, but I think I'll rescribe the panel lines and put a natural metal finish. <laughs> there is nothing from an airplane point of view worse than that, that than rescribing <laughs> and having a natural metal finish. I got a question for you. Talk about instructions and you know making notes and all on them. When you when you approach a model, do you take the instructions, read through it all with the sprues in front of you, and 
and identify all the parts or do you do it as you go step by step through the in, in, in other words how much pre preparation do you do before you start a project have you by the time you start a project have you read the instructions completely and identified each part on the sprue no i like i've read the instructions many times through i am of the school that doesn't like to cut all the parts out before I, I mm -hmm. with the idea that somehow it gets lost. Right. And, and so I am more the, I will identify the subsystem I'm going to build. And I will cut out all the pieces of that subsystem. And I will deal with that subsystem. And I will focus in on that subsystem. And, and, and I won't. I will try not to think about anything else because in my mind, if I'm working on the cockpit, whatever happens in the wheel wells is later on, you know, nothing, you know, nothing that, if, that will affect the cockpit is in the wheel wells. And, and so I look for things that I can kind of draw a circle around and, and cut all those parts and work on those parts, having read the instructions. Now, if stuff links to stuff later on, I'm going to, think about it and work about it. But I really try to zone in and simply do one um, at a, one subsystem at a time. And I think that's also a reason why models don't finish. They, they, they start with, you know, they're afraid to start with a subsystem and they start putting the wing tanks together for some reason. I, I, I've seen models from people um, who started kits and we've, uh, to be honest, uh, we've had cases where people in our club have passed away, and that's a whole other sub subject. Had had to deal with with other people's stash, and and, and I've looked at it, and I've, they've been started. And some of the weird things is they of all the things to start on a kit, they start with the wing tanks. Uh, you know, I I don't know if just to get them used to something. I, I I don't know. So you don't you don't build out of order ever. Yeah, I build out of order. Uh, if, if the subsystem I want to build, like the engine, I, I, I will build an engine sometimes, whether it's, it's, you know, step one or step five, but I will build a complete engine, but airplanes are usually just start with the cockpit. I mean, that that's where you start. I can't talk about other things as well. I mean, I mean, with tanks, it's just everything. That's just fun to just build, have at it, but with airplanes, I'm a cockpit, and, and the other thing is I can see for frustration why people don't finish their airplanes is that you can't build an airplane for more than half an hour without having to paint something. Mm -hmm. there, there is no, no long-term building of an airplane. Within a, a half an hour to an hour, you've got to paint something in the cockpit. And maybe that's why people end up building half, you know, an engine over here and wing stuff over there because they don't want to paint they just want to build. And, and I think that loses focus, to be honest. And I think that that makes for missing out. I, I agree with you completely that one of the major differences between aircraft modeling and some other genres is that you're right. It's, you know, in, in a lot of cases, somebody, especially if they're doing something out of the box, something like an armor kit, they could build the whole model before ever starting to paint anything. Whereas with aircraft models, you're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Right. And I agree. I agree with that too. Ar ar and I'm an armor modeler, but armor modeling generally is much more linear than aircraft modeling. And, and my system engineering is if you don't want to paint, you know, and, and we've had, it's cold, it's rainy, it's this, and that build an armor piece. Do you know what I mean? If you if you just don't want to paint something, or if you just feel like building, you know, there's plenty of armor out there in, in eight million scales, and, and nothing is more than you know is, is uh, supported more than armor. Do that. In fact, that's what I used to do. I used to bring an armor piece when I went to visit my mother in Florida, and I would sit there and, and I had to build an armor piece because I couldn't paint there, so I would build an armor piece. But again kind of go in with your eyes open. If, if you're going to build a model, expect that you're going to have to paint in a half an hour. You know, and, and, if, <laughs> and, and if you're at a place where you can't paint 
or anything like that, don't get frustrated that you can't do anything. You know, go over to the stash and get yourself, you know, some some armor piece. Um, so yes, that that is that that is the nature of the beast for airplanes. You're always doing, and, and on the on the good side, it is rather self-contained. Building a cockpit or, or some assembly, you know, with with a, a an armor piece. There's a lot of ways you can go. You can start with the canopy, you know, I mean, the, the, the gun, you can start with the tracks, you can start here and you can go there. This, you can start all over the place and you can move all over the place. With an airplane, you, it's easy to me to focus in on, on the cockpit and, and deal with it. And getting back to what I'm saying, get one thing, do one thing new, but don't do a whole bunch of new things. And to me, the exception that proves the rule is, is a while ago you guys you guys had a guy on who made a uh, a vacuum form. No, it was a short stir. Whatever it really was, it was a vacuum form, and he did new stuff. This and new stuff, and it took him four years to finish. Yeah, and he was smart enough. I gave him all the credit in the world. He was smart enough to stop when he he got to some way and redo and then go back and what have you, but. How many people can can donate? You know, can put four years towards a project, and so sure. pick one. Pick a always pick something new, and and I encourage everybody to, to PE. It's it's really not as bad as um, as people say. <laughs> the, 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 as we say, <laughs> as, the issue with PE, the problem that, that is that for see that's why a zoom kit. I think a zoom kit is real nice for an airplane. It's the glue, Ed. It's it's all in the glue. Yes, I, I I mentioned it's it's use use photo you know etch I you know, use photo glue to glue some parts uh, that'll do something. And, and speaking of hints, I have I have a hit a tip I have to bring up now in the in the middle of something. If you guys don't have mineral spirits in your uh, list of of tools, you should definitely get. Mineral spirits. I use yep. mineral spirits all the time. I use it to uh, obviously. I use it for washes, and I use it. You can unglue with mineral spirits. It will unglue to me a glue, and so yep. that's I interesting. Use, I use low odor mineral spirits. I get in a can from Lowe's. And it, it it works for it. It takes it takes thirty year old glue apart. The other thing it does is if you drop you know glue on a you know on your model, you know not to wipe it off. I would put a drop of mineral spirits on there. It tends to dilute the glue, and so it doesn't etch as bad as as if you let the, the glue sit there. Anyway, that's that's for nothing. Just just in, in, that's just in passing. <laughs> Well, if we've if we if we've picked our audience and now we've chosen a tenable amount of new stuff to do on this project, what what do you recommend next? Everybody knows the equation: time is money. But few people don't realize that the reverse is true: that money is time. And I do think, as part of the system engineering, you should consider: is there some thing you can spend some money on to buy you some time because time is the one thing you don't have you know even that guy even that guy from viking talks about it for the commercials you know we will all die i, I hate to tell you this we will all die with unfinished models you know if nobody's mentioned this before i, I hate to bring it up <laughs> You know, I'm an, I think we have. I'm an engineer, and I'm, I'm involved with reality. And we're all going to die with unfinished models. And so we don't have time. If there is something, you know, an, an aftermarket part that you can buy that will save you time, I encourage it. And, and I think for, for the example, for, for again, for airplanes, is, is the, uh, the masking for the cockpits. If they make a mask for your cockpit, Get it. It's just, yes, you can make your own. Yes, I've made my own. But the money isn't as good as the time I would save. Dave's got a comment here. 
I completely agree with you. In fact, to the point that I will not build a kit that does not have a canopy mask set available for it, simply because that is a time a time consuming area. And you're absolutely right. For six dollars or whatever, you're much better off buying that. In fact, to the point where I can take that even larger. I I have a motto of life's too short to build crappy kits. Oh, and and I I, yeah. I, I again I, there are enough models that I want to build in my lifetime that if my choice is between a 40-year-old monogram kit and something that Arma produced last week, no matter how much I want to have a model of that 40-year-old monogram kit, whatever it is, I'm going to build the Arma kit. I am absolutely not going to invest the additional time that I have left in my modeling life to trying to wrestle a 40-year-old kit into an acceptable uh, form. And, and I completely agree. And, and I think that's the number one system engineering point I, I would make is you don't have time for old kits. Um, they're just, that's the reason I started... I, I don't know if I mentioned how I started building models on, on the monogram series, you know, those, those airplanes, the Avenger, yeah. and Wildcat. Anyway, I still have some. There's no way, you know, and not to mention the C-47 and, and the, and the B-17. To, and, and it's, I agree. It's hard because basically we're cheap people. Let's face it. Engineers are cheap people and you're not going to go spend. No. Yes. Yes, we are. I, I, I hate to tell you, but yes, we are. And you're going to say, well, I'm not going to spend $60 to buy a new kit when I've got this kit, you know, that to me is 150 and I can get to something or other, you know, the, the trumpeter is what have you. And, and, and I, I cannot express in strong enough terms that your time is worth more. Yes. It's the one thing you can't buy more. Right. Of. And anytime you can, buy something like an aftermarket part. Yes, you can make your own 3D parts, and yes, you can do anything, and, and you can, uh, and if you like making your own wheels and, 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 you know, putting, making molds and stuff like that, by all means, please. But realize you're taking time out of your future to do that. And that, th that's what I, I would say in terms of system engineering, because it's, it's, the old expression is know thyself. And sometimes it's hus it's hard for us to know thyself, but the corollary is know thy model. And do you know what I mean? If you're going to build a 60 year old monogram model, don't be surprised if you spend a hell of a lot of time fixing the fit and doing this and having to put back the, the, the panel lines and what have you. And, and just again, for the frustration that you're going to find, if you, if you know it with eyes, uh, wide open, like some people want to do that. I know you had somebody on the line who likes to build older kits. Fine. But if you go into a, a, a an older kit thinking it's going to be a Tamiya kit, you're going to be very frustrated. It's going to be very <laughs> annoying. And that model is going to end up on the, on the shelf of doom. I'll just give you odds. You know, I, I, yeah. again... Don't, don't take an old monogram model and try to, you know, and because I've actually done it. I, I've taken a, a, an old 826 and, and, and rescribed it and did natural metal finish on it and stuff like that. And then and then the ICM came out, and I, I did that one. <laughs> and that was the one you saw at, at in Vegas. You know, and, and yeah, I, yeah. I will never do that again, by all means. <laughs> I will never do that again. And, and so – Understand, to, to me, understand the model. And, and again, it's easy. There are so many reviews. You don't have to do that. But you might want to go up and look up a, a, a couple of reviews and just see, you know, what the general is. You know, they'll, they'll tell you if, if this model takes a lot of work to do, even on a new kit. And so that's also part of your due diligence. Take a little time. And look what people say. You don't have to, you know, and, and they go crazy and what have you. And it's, you know, you, you can go down that rabbit hole for, you know, for, forever. 
on stuff. Well, but I do I do agree that uh, that spending a few minutes googling online and looking at a couple of build reviews even if you're you know you're reading a review where a guy is nitpicking a kit in a way that you might not do that the one thing it can tell you is if part in the instructions part C labeled C16 is actually D16 or E16 or in the instructions, this is shown, this is illustrated, mounted upside down. I mean, take advantage of those folks who've come before you. You don't have to agree with all their nitpicks about the shape issue or whatever, but they can tell you whether the part is mislabeled or the illustration is wrong. Why not let somebody else do that work for you? And, and again... Uh, we tend to be, uh, I would say, concerned, but sometimes old school, and, and I don't know how many of us still are, are don't use the internet or don't use Google to look up stuff. And, and I, again, I would encourage you to take advantage of all the tools that are available to you. Uh, look up, you know, uh, aftermarket parts. Look up all the details. There, there are so many choices. That before, you know, I, I think as part of your due diligence, again, before you start the model, you, you may want, you know, you may want to look. I've looked up. I'm going to I was going to do these decals, but I saw this decal sheet. I'm going to do this one instead, that kind of stuff. Because if if you do that in the middle, again, it it, it just upsets the flow. I, I, I think it, it is very much a flow kind of issue. If you can set up a good flow it just makes life so much easier. If you interrupt your flow, and, you know, and start, oh, okay, you know, I've started this, oh, there's an aftermarket, you know, Zoom set, okay, I'll go that. You know what I mean? You, you can't, you can't treat models as though, as though everything else is squirrels, and, and, and you're a dog and everything else is squirrels, and you just get lost and going out all over the place. You, you really do need to focus before you start. And again, I'm not making... They're not rules. They're hints and tips. The way someone would tell you at, at um, blackjack, if you want, if you're going to split aces and eights, you know, a double down on eleven. It's it's not a rule. It's just helpfully. And, and I and I do want to mention. I do have one rule, and I will mention my one rule of modeling. And if you follow this one rule, you'll be fine. You don't need any others. And the rule is: there's no step. Or instruction so simple that it can't be screwed up starting a chain of events ending with the model being thrown against the wall a poorly fitted part in the construction process that reverberates down the line and gives you alignment issues all six steps later there, there is nothing and if you follow that that so then i was going to talk about some of the things you, you do to do something different each time. Um, now I want to talk about, say you're, you're actually building. You actually want to, <laughs> you're actually starting to build something. And, and what the simple, you know, obviously I can't talk about, you know, for this model, do this. But in general, I would say when you're doing these sub-assemblies, and especially for, for, again, for airplanes, you know, you've got a cockpit, Normally, you've got a, maybe you've got a, a second gun, or you've got an engine. They're, they're nice, or, or, or the wheel wells. They're, they're nice things you can separate into, into sub-assemblies. And, and the goal is to go into the smallest, simplest sub-assembly, not the biggest. And one of the examples, you guys saw the Kingfisher, and, and I'm going to talk about the Kingfisher because the instructions are probably one of the worst I've ever seen. I've heard Good, that. Because I've got one to build. <laughs> the instructions tell you, okay, you've got a sub-assembly for the cockpit. You've got a sub-assembly for the gun station. You've got a sub-assembly in the middle. Okay? It tells you to glue all those three subsystems together and then put that big thing into the fuselage. Why would you do that when you can individually glue each subsection? into the fuselage 
and, and, and take care of the fit issues there. Why would you get some big, humongous thing? And now you have the fit issues of this whole big thing. Now, that raises an interesting question, Ed, for, from the systems engineering standpoint. Obviously, you read the instructions for that kit, and you looked at it, and you went, no, I'm not going to do that. When did you decide, no, I'm not going to do it that way? Is Did you do it when you read the instructions, or did you do it when you started working through the steps and went, no, it'll work better. If, at what point did you decide, I am going to vary from the instructor? The first time I saw that. Let me throw in real real quick. We're talking about the Kitty Hawk 30-second skill Kingfish. Yes, kit. absolutely. Sorry, you're right. All right, Ed, go for it. And I'm saying the first time I saw the instructions. Because to me, this is a general system engineering thing. I want the smallest sub-assembly I can get and fit it in. I, there is no way I want to put subsystems together if I don't have to. If each one can be put individually someplace, then then why would I want to combine them? And, and to me, it just makes it harder for the final fit. I want to make the final fit as easy as possible. And, and anything that, that prevents me from doing that I highlight at the very beginning of the instructions. I know I'm not going to do it that way. Yeah, I was going to ask you, did you actually make notes in the instructions when you were going through? No, I'm, you know, something to the effect of, no, I'm not going to glue these three together. I'm going to install them in the fuselage half individually. Yes. Skip, skip this step <laughs> or something like that. Yes. Uh, and... and I actually, and I think I said that to Mike, I actually wrote up, you know, a series of hints and steps for this kit that I, that I presented at my local model club and stuff. And, and that was one of the big things. That this, this is, this is, and don't ever do this again. Don't, don't ever do this. It has nothing to do with the Kingfisher. Don't, don't ever do this when you see this. I'll, I'll try to do, I'll, I'll try to put these multiple subsystems together if you don't have to. And, most of the time with airplanes, you don't have to. Um, you can put the, the the back the back gunner in separately. You know, it's separate from the from the front. That kind of thing. And, and anyway, it's just simple kind of things like that. And, and in general, my always advice for system engineering is glue one thing to one thing. At any given time, I'm only gluing one thing. To one thing. So, if you're, you know, if you're gluing a wing, I'm not gluing the, the the pylons on at the same time. I'm not gluing anything else that will affect how the one thing is to be glued. And so, even when I glue stuff into the fuselage, I glue it to one side, and I put the other in, inside there to hold it but I don't glue it at that step. The step of inserting the subsystems is separate from this, the step of gluing the fuselage together. Let, let me ask you a question, Ed. As a systems engineer, okay, and instructions are a set, in, in most cases, a set of engineering drawings. Yes. What do you think the state of instructions are generally? Because... They seem to vary wildly to me as far as quality is concerned. If you understand that instructions are made to use the fewest number of pages possible, then everything makes sense. They want to use the fewest pictures, they can get away with it. Why else would you tell somebody to put the pedo tube on on step two? You know, I mean, why, why would anybody do that? You know, only because the picture, they're showing the fuselage going together and maybe they're showing the wings attached and they throw on the antenna because the picture's there and they throw on the pedo tube. It's all about number, the minimum number of pages. It's not about the true sequence. That's what, that's what instructions 
That's what you have to provide. That's the system engineering, actually, that you have to provide that I can't tell you because they're individual for every kit. Gotcha. For every kit, when you do look at the instructions, they are not a sequence. They tell you where the parts go. They don't tell you when to do them. They think they do. You think they do, but they don't. And it's your job to figure out the best sequence. And I, and I think that is why models don't get finished. You don't paint yourself into a corner. You glue yourself into a corner. And you break off the pedo too. <laughs> you, you follow a sequence that puts you in a, in a shape, in a, in a place you don't want to be, can't get out of, and it's just made a mess. And the modeling just goes on the shelf. Yeah, because I complete. I completely agree with that. You, did, <laughs> you can model yourself into a corner. You did not spend the right amount of time looking at the sequence, and, and I'm sorry you have to do that. And I'm sorry the instructions are basically are lousy, but that is the, the true nature of the beast. And what's even worse is if you go after market parts, if you have photo etch. And, and, you know, if you're going to add photo etch to it, and especially if you're, if, if you're doing more than a Zoom kit, if, you're, if, you, if you've had the Big Ed set, and, and, and I admit I, I have, I thought they named it after me, and so I will use the Big Ed set as a challenge. The real challenge is how do you, how do you integrate that sequence with the instruction sequence? Now you're dealing with two sets of instructions that you have to integrate. And if you do it wrong, you break off all the photo etch parts. You know, you do it wrong or you can't get to the part because it's, it's buried under something else. And so, again, that raises your frustration level. And so that's why, to tell you the truth, one of the kits, if you guys haven't built, and, and I, I'm, I guess I'm shooting, you know, here, but... I like the, you know, the Edward slash Hasegawa kits where Edward takes a Hasegawa kit and they upgun it with some photo mm -hmm. etch and, and some resin and a really nice decal sheet. And the good thing is they upgun the instructions. They actually integrate the photo etch with the instructions. And so that, that takes a little, you know, that, that takes a lot off your mind. You don't have to physically, you know, mentally do that because I think that runs into a lot of trouble. And so I, I can't talk enough about sequence um, to do that. And that leads, you know, I hate to get into some more engineering, but that leads into what they call kind of degrees of freedom, which is nothing more than ways you can misalign the parts. <laughs> is, is degrees of freedom. And, and again, I hate to use the, the, the Kingfisher as an example, but their instructions for the engine kind of show you where to put a pipe, but not how, what have you. And, and if your instructions are unclear on where to put something that attaches at both ends, and you don't know how to do that, and you pick the wrong way, you may not find out for four pages because the other end of the pipe may not get glued to for page six. And, you're, and you glue the first part on page two. Absolutely. And so you need, you have to align, and, and I call it degrees of freedom because it, it really means how, how you have to align things. And at some point you want to align to the one thing that can't change. And, and as an example, what I talk about, what has no degrees of freedom is your fuselage sides. There, there is no other way to glue your fuselage together other than to glue it together. Okay, right. there's, there's, there's no way to there's, inch it out. There's, there's no sort of freedom of movement. It goes through it, its side, and that's it. On the other hand, if you want something with tons of problems with alignment, is landing gear on an airplane. Oh, yeah. With, with rare exception, you're right, there's way too much play in most of those alignments. But... That, by the way, go, goes back to what you were talking about earlier with Googling and reading previous uh, builds. 
you could, that's one of the, th- the traps you can find by learning from other people's experience. Exactly. When, when they say, well, I put it on this way and then four, four pages later, I had to break it off because it wasn't aligned correctly. And here's how you need to align that pipe. And, and I, I agree, especially for landing gear. Not only do you have the problem of you have to align it in three axes, but you have to align the second one to be symmetrical. It has to be identical. Yeah. You can have it so they're both aligned correctly and still screw up because one is longer than the other and they don't fit yeah. right. And, and so, align, you know, basically symmetry is a bitch. There's just no other way to talk about it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get colorful, but symmetry for an airplane model, that, that is our death is symmetry. You really don't have yeah. to deal with symmetry on a tank too much. You know, I, I guess the tracks can be missed wrong or something like that. Floating tracks is one of the things that you see sometimes in armor. But yes, it's much less common than trying to align left and right in an aircraft. And, and that is so important because when you go to a contest, that's the first thing. I, I know many people talk about, you know, you talk about the, the having the technical aspect and, and the artistic aspect of a model. And, and the trouble with contests is that you have to pass the technical level first before they consider your artistic level. So the fact that you made a damn wonderful cockpit and paint job doesn't do anything if the wheels are crooked. It really, and I'm sorry it's that way, and people complain, and, and they say it shouldn't be that way, but it is. You mess up the technical part, you don't get to be judged on your, on your artistic. You just don't, it's not like figure skaters. Where they, where they judge them both. You don't have that option. And so symmetry is, is, is tough, but that's what they judge on as the construction. You know, you, you need, that's part of the system engineering. You have to make it so it, it, the, the construction is correct. Well, Ed, we're running up on an hour here. Is there any other topic you would like to talk about? It's on your on your on your on your note page before we uh, have to have to part ways. I, I, I'm looking and I'm getting good, good to the end of my notes. Um, well, good. We're on time then. <laughs> that's a good system engineering if we're on yes, time. Yes. Yes. And, and again, what I'm I'm trying to show is you want again. You know what, what you do is you tell them what you tell them, tell them, and tell them what you tell them. You want to make your model so this no visible flaws at the distance of your audience and that audience changes and your model needs that your construction needs to change to account for your audience and i'm not taking anything away from anybody from fun but to me the real fun is finishing a model and, and the expression i would tend to use is when you finish a model you get to see what was in your mind's eye now sitting on the table and that is more fun than pretty much pretty much anything and i can honestly say most of the tips i'm giving you can do with your modeling fluid (laughs) (laughs) well i i i completely agree with you that there is nothing uh that will get you modeling than finishing a model it is success builds upon success and, and that's all I could basically start here. There, there's plenty of other things to, to get into, but if, if you just follow those rules, I, I have, and I would love to hear, I mean, I, I'm sure we're going to hear some comments back, but I would love to hear if this will help you finish your next model. I, obviously, no one's going to be finishing it anytime soon, but if you apply these rules, I would love to hear if you get to finish your next model. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think so, Ed. We 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 appreciate you joining us tonight, and we talked. Uh, well, I talked to you off offline a little bit about whether you're going to be at Omaha or not. I hope you're hope you can 
find your way there. If not, uh, the issue is it's tough for me to fly because then I really can't take any models because it's really tough to bring stuff to pack up for fly. Yeah. And if the drive from California to Omaha is. Uh, that's got to be murder. Well, can't you, t- can't you take a suborbital flight? You know, just. I, I, it depends. I have to see if, if it'll line up with any cool shows that my wife can go to and then we can make a thing of it. Uh, if if you are a quilt, if your wife is a quilt guy, have you ever been to Paducah? No, 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 no. And she wants to go there. It's it's on the it's on the bucket list to go to Paducah, Kentucky. You need to go. You need to see that museum. I am in no way, shape, or form a quilter, but you can go and see that museum and appreciate the skill and artistry involved. And if you go down on the weekend when they hold the the big thing, it's it's one of the most amazing thing. It it puts a national model convention to shame. <laughs> I know, and they give out real money, you know, yes. to awards. So yes, I, I agree. Yeah. It's on the list to get to get there sometime, and we'll probably do another cross country trip and get to it. Ed, thank you for your insight, and it was a real pleasure meeting you in Las Vegas and the way this all kind of happened and man, I look forward to what you kick out next, especially in 30 second scale. Absolutely. Uh, Can't wait. Yes, I, I sent you those pictures of the, of the Thunderbolt and I will send you That's some right. of the other stuff I, I, I made to go with it. And I have plenty of other ideas. If you want to talk some other time. We'll absolutely do that. Sounds good, Ed. Thank, thanks a lot for joining us. It's been yep. a blast. Take care. Thank you. Well, Dave, it's good to get caught up with Ed again, and I think we're going to be seeing him in Omaha. I hope he's going to make I it. I hope so. I want to sit down and talk with him face-to-face again. I really enjoyed that in Las Vegas and, and would like to do it again. Mike, we're, we're toward the end of the episode. I assume that your the glass is getting empty. So what did you think of your modeling fluid? Uh, it's a very young taste in bourbon. Uh, it's a little hot for 40 proof compared to like Basil Hayden's. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's got a real strong kind of, uh, I would call it chocolate flavor, not like candy bar, but it's kind of like a bittersweet, almost coffee yeah. kind of gotcha. chocolate flavor. Uh, and y- you remember that, uh, Oh, who gave us that, that Garrison brothers from Texas, Rob Booth. Yeah. Rob Booth. Uh, it's kind of got a, a PD vibe going to it. Kind of like that stuff had that leathery gotcha. kind of taste. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not bad. Um, they probably don't have any where I'd buy it. I would definitely, I would not, I would probably not buy this for myself. Gotcha. So, uh, Evan, how's the, how's the ginger beer? Well, I polished this thing off before we were even at the bench time halftime report. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Good man. I went through it pretty quick. Uh, I've had this up before. I love it. It's, it's a good quality. I, honestly, I can't talk too much about the tasting notes, listening to you guys talk about that stuff. That's still above my level. I'm still a young boy, and I'm sure you guys have drank some <laughs> bourbon that's been aged longer than I've been alive. So uh, I'm looking forward. To, I'm looking forward to trying some of your uh, your your stuff when I'm at the Mojo Dojo. If it doesn't yeah. destroy me, yeah, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll 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 make sure that you you don't get hurt. <laughs> well, how's yours, Dave? How's your highball? My my highball is excellent. Again, dad was was a smart and frugal man, so he knew that if you're making highballs, you don't use high-end whiskey, or I mean high-end bourbon, you don't use Basil Hayden or Bullet or anything like that. Uh, Rebel Yell, mixed in with Coke, perfectly acceptable. Well, he'd be proud of you, Dave. Yep. So, Mike, got any shout out? Yes, I do. I'd like to shout out all the folks who've contributed to us here at Plastic Model Mojo. You can do that one of two ways. You can come to us through our, our PayPal link. You can go to www.plasticmodelmojo.com. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a heart icon. You can click that and go straight to the PayPal page and make a one-time contribution or manage your own recurring contribution. You can also go to Patreon and become a patron of the show. You can do that at www.patreon.com slash plastic model mojo and there you can have a managed recurring payment or donation to us uh, from a dollar on up and we would just really appreciate it uh it really helps out a lot folks yes so evan do you have a shout out 
Yes, there is a YouTube channel that I'd like to give a shout out to. And this kind of goes back to the cross-pollination we were talking about earlier. This YouTube channel is called Boomer Diorama. Uh, this is a YouTube fellow who's an old old and well-skilled modeler, let's just say. He used to work in the movie industry and he's a, like, I guess you call him a professional model builder. Very skilled and he is working on mainly a, a very, very well-detailed model railroad. Now, a lot of people aren't who listen to this aren't in model railroading, but there's still so much you can learn from him because a lot of his videos, it's almost like a Bob Ross kind of experience where you can just listen to this guy talk about stories and his experiences. And while he shows you how to scratch build like a, a really photorealistic looking tree stump or, or scratch build a building, weather something really well, you know, it's everything that could be applied to weathering or dioramas, and also, of course, model railroading itself, which is you know woodworking and ele- electrical work and all that stuff. His videos, I just love to listen to them in the background, and I've learned so much from him, and it, it really uh, helps me in all my modeling fields. So it, like the tanks as well for weathering, but also the model road I'm working on as well. So anybody who's interested in listening to that kind of stuff, I think you would definitely enjoy this guy's video. So once again, that's a Boomer Diorama. I'll have to look at that. I don't think I've come across that before. Mike, you probably learned something from him because he's doing a lot of diorama work and he's doing almost like the night shift technique where he's airbrushing a static grass and using like mauves and and colors you wouldn't think about when you're uh, doing scenery work, but that all really look really natural in the end once he's done with the whole scene. No, I'll have to check it out then. I got a lot to learn. I like what I've done on my little base, but I can already see some things I would do different next time. <laughs> What about you, Dave? What's your shout out? I want to give a shout out to every modeler out there. You all are a bunch, you know, we modelers all have the story of the one modeler who's the, the color Nazi or the rivet counter or whatever. And those, honest to gosh, I think those people stick out in our mind because they're actually so rare in this hobby. Modelers are some of the best people out there. Some of the most pleasant, some of the nicest, kindest people out there. And uh, all of you who reached out and expressed your condolences uh, uh, with my father's recent passing, it meant a great deal to me. It meant a great deal to my family. My, My mother was amazed that people all over the world who never never i've never met who who obviously never met my father uh reached out to express their condolences and, and you all are a bunch of good people and i want you to know that it really means a hell of a lot so thank you to all of you and uh you make doing this all worthwhile thanks well dave we got a long one yes we did but a good one Thanks for joining us tonight, Evan. No, no problem. Thanks for having me on. I uh, love hanging out with you guys. And, you know, it's just like what I miss, which is uh, now because of COVID, you know, hanging out with the buddies and building models. That's a lot harder to do now. But this is the next best thing, being able to chat models with some great buddies over the Internet like this. Now, Evan, you have to promise you're going to come back and do this again, because uh, there's a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff that you and you and Mike can geek out on. And I got to admit, I really enjoy just sitting back listening to you two geek out about. Well, we'll have to find another mutual topic. I don't think that'll be hard. That won't be hard at all. KV ones. <laughs> yes, we, we could do KV ones. You know I love. Listen, I'm, again, not an armor model or all. One of the tanks that I really think is cool, just from an aircraft guy's perspective, is the KV one. So I would love to sit and listen to you two talk to each other for for a while about nothing but KV ones. Well, we'll keep that in mind. So thanks again, Evan. We'll let you get back to your business. And Dave, as they always say, so many kicks, so little time. Take it easy, Dave, and take it easy, Evan. Thank you. Thank you.